Hello, and welcome once again to Lato's Law. I'm Steve Lato, attorney at Law in the State of Michigan. I've been practicing on it for 25 years in the fields of consumer protection and lemon law. I often write about this stuff for places like roadandtrack.com, and I've written a few books as well. Today we're going to address the issue of why car salesmen lie. <laughs> why do car salesmen lie? And I'll tell you, it's something that I actually deal with on a daily basis in my office, and I can tell that consumers across America deal with it on a daily basis as well. My good friend uh, and favorite writer, Hunter S. Thompson, well, I always considered him a friend, but he's no longer with us, but he wrote a book called The Curse of Lono, one of his lesser-known works, but it's fabulous. Actually, it's my favorite book by Hunter S. Thompson. Had a chapter entitled, Why Do They Lie to Us?, which I always think of when I talk to people about car sales people. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out right now, when I say car salesmen, I'm not saying that only men lie, so we have to talk about car sales people, but it's harder to say car sales people. But car sellers lie all the time. And I was reminded of this on a recent phone call from a client who called me up and said, hey, Steve, I have an issue. Um, and let me tell you a story about a car I bought, or truck, actually. And this guy lives at one end of the state of Michigan, and he was looking for a particular truck because he needed a truck that would tow a particular trailer. Very specific needs. He knew what he wanted. And he'd done a ton of research, and he had discovered that there's a particular truck made by uh, one of the big three automakers that a couple of years ago had an optional towing package that involved a different rear end. And for those of you who don't know, uh, the rear end in a truck, we're talking about the gear ratio, not the torque ratio, <laughs> but the gear ratio. And it has to do with how fast the vehicle drives at certain speeds with respect to how fast the engine is turning, the RPMs and so on. Uh, and you get a shallower gear, uh, and it does uh, uh, better at like highway speeds, but a steeper gear will accelerate and, and um, uh, pull from a, a low speed uh, better. And so he, with respect to pulling a heavier trailer, he had wanted to get the truck that had the towing package, and I believe it had a steeper gear. So he did a bunch of research. He found the vehicle he wanted. It was a particular make and model of truck with a particular option package. And he starts calling around because most people who are advertising these trucks on the internet don't actually say what the rear gear ratio of the truck is. They simply say, I've got this truck, make, model, and year. And he calls around and he finally finds a dealer at the other end of the state of Michigan. So he's still within the state of Michigan, both ends of this transaction, but he's going to have to drive a couple hundred miles to get to this truck. So he calls the place, it's a dealership, and he gets a salesman on the phone. He says, hey, I notice you guys have got this particular make, model, brand of truck uh, with this model that I'm looking for. And he goes, can you tell me if it's got this particular rear end in it, referring to the gear ratio? And the salesman says, let me take a look. And the salesman comes back and goes, good news. This truck's got the gear ratio you need. <laughs> Not the torque ratio, the gear ratio you need. And my caller says, great, uh, I want to come down and look at it. So the caller gets in his vehicle and drives the uh, long drive to the other end of the state. And he looks at the truck and he drives the truck and it runs great. But now he's got this question in his mind and he asks himself, how do I know it's got the correct gear ratio? Because gear ratios, they can be determined. Okay, and I know there's three guys in my entire audience who are listening to me right now or watching me who say, I know how to calculate a gear ratio. You put the vehicle up on a hoist, put the vehicle in neutral, you turn the wheel and you count different things. I think it's the drive shaft revolutions uh, and, and, as, a, as a divider into the number of times the wheels turn and so on. But again, it can be done, but an easier way to do it is, is if you had the build sheet or the window sticker. But this is a used vehicle. And so the guy doesn't have those things. But he says, don't worry, I assure you this is correct. And he walks out, and he's got a piece of paper that's been printed, like a, a, you know, out of a printer, but it looks like it came off the internet or something. And it appears to have some mumbo-jumbo about this particular vehicle. And it mentions the gear ratio, and it's the gear ratio he's looking for. And so the guy goes, yeah, here's a piece of paper that shows that, you know, this is, this is correct. And so the guy looks at the piece of paper, he sees the numbers he likes, he says, okay, I'll buy it. So they negotiate a sale. The guy buys the vehicle, gets in the truck, drives it back to where he lives. And shortly after he gets back, as you might imagine, all my stories have got predictable endings because we know where this is going. Because I already told you that we're talking today about why car salesmen lie. The truck didn't have the correct rear end in it. 
And now, it's not something you'd figure out immediately, but he said that when he went to hook up his trailer and drive it, it didn't perform as he expected. So he took the truck to the local dealer that deals in trucks of that kind, and they ran his VIN and said, oh, this truck does not have that optional rear end package. And um, there were several different competing notions racing through his mind at that moment in time, one of which was, hey, that car salesman lied to me. But number two is, I wonder, could I just get the rear end changed? And the dealer said, well, theoretically you could, but it doesn't, it's not as easy as it used to be. In the old days, I'm talking about the 60s, for instance, and you didn't like the gear ratio in your Z28 Camaro, you could pop the rear end apart and take the two gears out that we're talking about the ratio of, replace them with a different ratio, put it back together again, and drive it. Today, we've got all kinds of computerized modules and things that control stuff, read stuff, and they both depend on knowing what kinds of ratios you have back there, and so it's not as easy as it used to be. And the guy said, it could be done, but it would cost you thousands of dollars, and um, we wouldn't recommend you do that because there's a chance we couldn't even get it done right. (laughs) At least they're being honest with him. So he then placed the phone call to his car seller and said, you told me this truck had this particular gear ratio in it, and it doesn't. And the salesman said, oh, I'm sorry. And he said, well, will you buy the truck back? And the guy goes, no, we don't buy trucks back. I, I, and, and, and by the way, I, I feel the need to tell people this because it comes up quite often in my line of work. Car dealers don't buy cars back. They don't buy used cars back. I, I've almost, I can't think of an example in 25 years of practicing law, where someone's called me and said, hey, Steve, I got a used car buyer, uh, used car dealer to buy my car back from me. And they just just don't do it. It's a one-way trip. The cars go off the lot when you buy them. They never go back. It's a one-way trip, okay? So just think of it that. It's always going to go, cars go out, they don't come back. So he's he's saying to the guy, he said, well, look, you told me it had this particular rear end, and it doesn't. And the guy said, oh, sorry. Um, okay, Uh, thanks for calling. (laughs) So, of course, the gentleman calls me and says, Steve, what can we do here? Now, I didn't have to see his paperwork. I knew the answer to the question. The seller had lied to him. The car salesman had lied to him. And this is why car salesmen lie. Because they can. And I don't mean because they're physically capable of it. Everybody can lie, okay? Anybody, anybody can can do things like that. But car salesmen are empowered to lie. They're encouraged to lie. And the reason is, as I told the caller, I said, do you have a copy of the purchase agreement handy? And he said, "Uh, no, but what would be on it if it was? I said, well, if you pull it out, and for the people in the video, I can show you what I'm talking about, but on the uh, podcast, You just have to imagine that's a piece of paper with writing on it. (laughs) But the typical purchase agreement in Michigan has a section on it that says important buyer information. And the typical one I see, and it's a form that's been pre-printed by some association that sells these to car dealers, important buyer information uh, at number four has the most important thing here. And it basically says our salespeople can lie to you. But it doesn't say it quite like that. But this document... Purchase agreement was signed by the buyer and by the seller, and that document becomes the legal binding agreement between the parties. Okay, so you go into dealer to buy a car, dealer's got a guy sitting there who's selling you the car. The two of you dicker the terms back and forth, a word I taught you three weeks ago. (laughs) And then after you agree on the terms, you reduce them to writing and you put them within this document. I've mentioned before, it fits in the four corners of the document. It becomes part of the agreement. But the pre-printed language is what kills you here because the purchase agreement says right on it, I'm going to read you the whole sentence and we'll break it down. The salesperson has no authority to make and dealer shall not be bound by any promises or representations unless they are written on this order and approved by dealer's authorized representative. So number one, the most important thing is the salesman has no authority. The salesman's not allowed to make you promises. 
Statements he makes to you are considered meaningless and unenforceable as a matter of law because you signed this agreement and you agreed to it. So you agreed when you bought the truck, in the example I gave you earlier, with the bad gear ratio, you signed a document saying, I acknowledge the salesman has got no authority to make those promises to me. In other words, if he makes the promises to me, that's one thing. He's not even allowed to do it. So when you say, hey, Steve, the guy lied to me, I say, of course he did. He's, he, he, nothing he says to you is enforceable anyways. What's the difference? You can ignore everything he says. He's got no authority to make any promises. But second of all, the dealer shall not be bound by the promises made by the, sell, the, the, the sell, salesman. So the dealer can actually say, we don't even acknowledge what that guy says is correct. He's, he's got no authority to make promises and that's the, you have agreed that the dealer acknowledges. So there's two levels here they're protecting themselves with. The salesman can't make the promises and he can't bind the dealer. So you go, what's the salesman role in all this? But he's trying to get you to buy the car. That's his job. He's a car salesman. He's got one job, to sell cars. His job isn't to make promises. His job isn't to, to, to convince you uh, of, of things that, that are going to happen in the future and, and ways that you can bind the dealer and hold them legally responsible. No, no, no. His job is to sell you a car. It, in fact, this transaction will go more smoothly in the future if you just understand his only job is to sell me a car. Everything else he says to me is unenforceable and, and cannot be gone back on by me. I can't go back after these people for this stuff because I sign a document that says salesman has no authority to make and dealer shall not be bound by and then it's important to notice it says any promises or representations unless they're written on this order. So a representation is just simply, you know, the thing about uh, the gear ratios, okay? But promises, think about that. The salesman can make you a promise. He can promise you something. He can look you in the eyes and say, I promise you this. And it can be, I promise you that if this car breaks down, we'll fix it. I promise you that this vehicle is a one-owner car. I promise you, I promise you. He can make all these promises to you. And then you sign a document that says, I acknowledge that he couldn't do that. Okay? The document they prepared, the pre-printed document, has the language that says any promises are not actionable. And you sign that document. And then finally it says promises, representations, unless they're written on this order. So when the gentleman called me about the gear ratios in his truck, the first thing I asked him was, I said, did you ask them to write that on the purchase agreement that the vehicle had that particular gear ratio? And he said, no. I said, did you ask them to write on the purchase agreement that the vehicle had that optional towing package? And he said, no. I said, well, if you had done that, then you could make the argument that since it was reduced to writing on this document, it's enforceable as a promise or a representation. But of course, it all falls apart because the very last section says none of this counts unless it's approved by the dealer's authorized representative. So in other words, the only way that you could actually go back on these people, they sold you the truck with the wrong gear ratio, and you actually made this in a way that you can do something about it, is if you took the purchase agreement and you're sitting there negotiating the price and you say, by the way, I asked you if this thing's got the correct gear ratio, and you said it did. And the guy says, of course it does. You say, great. I want to put that on the purchase agreement right here where it says other terms directly beneath this box of, of seven <laughs> deadly clauses, <laughs> number four of which we're talking about right now. And uh, we want to put right in there that this truck has the XYZ towing package and the gear ratio of 3.23 to 1, or whatever it is, okay? And if... You can get the salesman to write that in the box, and by the way, you can't, but if you could, if you could, you could then say, I'm, I'm willing to sign that, and you'd sign it, and he would then take that to his boss, and he would show it to his boss and say, I need you to sign this, because it needs to be signed by the dealer's authorized representative, and the, sale, the salesman is probably not an authorized representative, but the manager is going to look at it and go, who authorized you to make this kind of a promise? And now, here's the thing. If the truck legitimately had that towing package and they knew it, they might put that in there and let you get away with it. Except that 
they're going to be concerned that what if there's something wrong with this they don't quite understand. In other words, you say, I want this particular towing package and it's got this particular gear ratio. And you call it the, um, you know, option one towing package. So they put down option one towing package. And unbeknownst to either of you, that year was actually called an option two towing package. I'm just making stuff up here, but the point is this. That you could then later come back and say, hey, guys, this is option one in the written agreement, but it's got the option two. I want out of this deal. So I'm here to tell you, in 25 years of handling these cases, I have never, never seen anyone get anything any significance added to a, seller, a sales contract where it says other things, other options. I've seen the dealer add things in there, such as, yeah, we're going we're gonna to sell you the rust coating, the fabric protection, the paint sealant, the, uh, you know, these kind of things. They'll often put that under other terms, but they will never let you say, oh, by the way, I want it to say one owner vehicle. I want it to say new engine. I want it to say whatever, the, whatever promises the seller had made to me. I want it to say those things. They won't do that. They literally will simply refuse to do that and say, no, we will not do that. Um, so if it was going to be enforceable, it would have to go into that box. But again, like I said, the, the thing that kills every single one of these cases where somebody says, hey, the seller lied to me. They lied to me. I always say, yeah, they lied to you because they can. And the reason they can is a sales agreement contains the language like I said, it's, it's item number four under the most common purchase agreements I see here in Michigan uh, under important buyer information. And people tell me, they say, Steve, I, I signed those documents. There's 20 pages of paperwork. Some of it was double-sided. Some of it was 11 by 17. Some of it was fine print. Some of it was different colors. Uh, and it was five minutes to closing. Imagine that. And they're having me sign all these documents. I don't have time to read this stuff. Who reads this stuff? No one reads this stuff. But the point is that this is what kills you because it says the salesperson has no authority to make and the dealer shall not be bound by any promises or representations unless they are written on this order and approved by dealer's authorized representative and none of that ever happens. And I know that people get tired of me saying this, but when a car seller is telling you stuff, you just need to ignore all of it. Even if you ask specific questions, I have people say, Steve, I asked the guy specifically, what about this? And he looked me right in the eyes and said, yes, you can count on this. Or no, that's not the case. Boom, boom, boom. Whatever the promise is, it seems significant at the time. And like I said, unfortunately, paragraph four of important buyer information explicitly excludes promises made by the salesperson unless they're reduced to writing on the purchase agreement and countersigned by the dealer's authorized representative, which never happens. That's why car salesmen lie or car sellers lie. They lie because they can and they're protected by their own documents, which most consumers do not read. So I'm sorry to tell you, car salesmen do lie and that's why. Questions or comments, shoot them my way. Late a lot of come. L e h t o s l a w dot com. I'm on Twitter, which you should follow me on, by the way, because I often post when I put up a new podcast. That's how you find out about it first. I'm on Twitter at Steve Leto at S T E V E L E H T O, and this show is on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Podbean, Google Play, and YouTube. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Bye bye.